All right, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to yet another installment of David Green Real Estate on a Friday live here from YouTube and Facebook and uh, Instagram for the moment. But if you're on Instagram, come on over to David Green Real Estate on YouTube to watch us live. Uh, we weren't here last week. We missed you last week. Uh, we just had finished BPCon and David had some traveling that he had to do to Fort Lauderdale and uh, we were all over the place. But uh, super excited to jump into tonight's topic. We actually have a guest speaker with us that's going to be coming in and chatting all things with David uh, and myself about ADUs. Uh, another word for that is accessory dwelling unit. Those are things that you can build on a property uh, and you can get additional revenue. You can figure out ways to add value to your property. And so we have one of the leading experts in real estate on ADUs. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, how that can help benefit you. Uh, but the cool thing about doing a live program like this is you actually get the opportunity to come on and chat with David and myself and Derek and ask questions specifically related to ADUs. Maybe it's a question about hiring contractors. Maybe it's a question about construction and how construction works. Or uh, maybe you have an ADU or you, you don't know what the ADU laws are where you live and want to figure out how to learn more about that. We would love to have you come on and ask that question with us. So I'm actually going to drop right here at the bottom of the screen. It's a little ticker. We're going to have this throughout the week. And uh, if you text the number below, it's 833 seven 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 zero three zero nine you can actually come in and join david and the rest of us live here to get your questions and answer we'd love to chat with you about that so david how are things going in your world uh well i'm recovering from a cold that's not my favorite but to be expected when you go to bp con and shake hands and take pictures and Kiss Hug, babies. kiss babies for thousands of people and then sleep three hours a night and then fly in airport. So I think my immune system just got worn down. So I may have to mute myself and blow my nose every five to 10 minutes here. But other than that, I'm doing pretty good. I think uh, the economy is definitely uh, being affected by federal policy. So there's some good stuff to talk about there. Uh, we've needed a slowdown like this for a while. So we're now at a place where you're separating the wheat from the chaff. If you're one of those people who said, well, I would buy, but the market's too hot. I'm waiting for it to slow down. Now we're going to see if you've been talking about it, if you're going to be about it because the market has slowed down and you have an opportunity to buy. And if you're still not buying, well, now we know it's a problem with you. So I think that could be an interesting topic. And then I'm putting a lot of time into working on the new book. This has been the hardest but the most fun book I've ever written, and I think it's going to change a lot about our brand as a whole. I think that the type of content we put out and the direction I take is going to be focused more on personal finance and personal development. Real estate obviously is affected by that, and I'm always going to love real estate, but it'll be more than just here's how you buy houses. It's going to be here's how you build wealth in general, and um, here's how you work on the elements of yourself that are probably holding you back. My personal belief is that if we don't have the things we want in life, it's 100% our fault and our pride doesn't like to hear that. But if your girl's not attracted to you, if your man is irritated by you, like it's easy to blame the other person, it's our fault. There's something about ourselves that we need to change. If you're not making the money you want to be making or if you're not having the success you want to be, there's something that's got to change in you. And uh, predators, gurus, people that want to sell you courses, they all tell you the solution is something outside of you. Okay. Learn this method, do this thing, buy this course, whatever, you can get what you want. It's almost always you got to change something with you. And we hate changing so much that we are willing to throw all of our money towards a course that hardly ever works. And so uh, we've been spending more time on these lives just kind of talking about personal development. It doesn't have to suck. It doesn't have to be horrible. Working out can be fun. Eating healthy can be fun. Kyle, you've lost a lot of weight. You're looking incredible. You're not complaining about how much it sucks. You're actually saying, David, you should do this too. I feel really good. It's a positive thing, right? So if life works that way with fitness, it can absolutely work that way with finances and with uh, personal finance or sorry, personal uh, development and everything else too. So that's what's been on my mind. How's, uh, how's San Diego for you? San Diego is beautiful. Um, taking a lot of time spent at, uh, with the kids at the beach, hanging out and uh, just enjoying the, the sun and the fun. But 
I, I also got to say, there's no coincidence that your Pillars book or your new book that you're writing is is coming out at, at a time when the economy and it seems like the world is just really shifting right now. So I don't I don't think it's a coincidence that those two things are lined up at the same time. And I think that uh, we're definitely going to see a lot of positive change that comes from that book. That's a good point. It almost feels like it's divinely inspired because it's been about two years in the making and it finally came to the surface right when the economy was getting the worst. That's a good point. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, man, super excited to uh, chat tonight about, uh, thank you, Jesse. Yes. Having a great time in San Diego. Uh, it is very tempting for a NorCal person to want to move down here because it's just always really, really nice. The air is fresh. It's beautiful. Uh, it's a lot different than, than NorCal, but um, yeah, super excited tonight to chat about ADUs. Um, we've got Mr. Derek here. And just a reminder, if you just joined us and you want to come in, you want to chat with David, you want to chat with Derek, you want to chat with me about ADUs, um, type it in, or sorry, text us at the number below, 833-777-0309. We would love to have you here. So let's go ahead and bring in Derek and uh, get this party started. What are you eating, by the way, David? What you got? This is a uh, chicken salad, actually. <clears throat> First I love time. It. I ate a little bit today before that. It's funny, Kyle made it sound like he's taking his kids to the beach, but I basically had him working all day long and talking to me. So didn't get as much beach time as you thought, but I ate a little bit before our first uh, interview that we had today. Now, a little bit now. Nice. I know. I'm, I'm making, I was telling Derek right before uh, we started here, I'm making mac and cheese for the kids right now. So I got to go make sure it uh, doesn't overheat there. And yeah, we know where so you're I'll going. You have to and out. Jump out. That's funny. <laughs> That's right. Derek. My man, how do you say your last name? Is it Sherell? Yeah, yeah, you nailed it. Like awesome. Pharrell? Yeah, yeah, like Pharrell with an S H. What happened to Pharrell? <laughs> Is he still making music, or did he just disappear? I don't know. I don't know. I, I the other music one I, I get often is like the Sherells. I guess there was a group in the I haven't the heard 70s. of them. It does. This is completely unrelated to anything you're about to say. So I apologize for hijacking here. I've always wondered how it happens that you get a person like Pharrell, who I assume is talented. He's winning Grammys and everyone talks about him and all of these hit songs are produced by him. Or say the Eagles, like some of the best music ever made, Linkin Park, okay? I'm assuming that people listening to this like music and Derek, I'm assuming you're one of those people. How do they go from being that good to just nothing? No more new music. I can't remember the last time Linkin Park made a song that was listenable to me. Like, so good to, what the hell is this? This sounds like every other boring song that's out there. Like, how did the Eagles go from making some of the best music ever made to just, now they can't make music anymore? What is the deal with that? Like, how does Pharrell lose all of it? Do you guys have any idea on the theory of how you go from this good? It's not like you age out. It's not like you're an athlete who just got too old. What What's happening? I think it's one of two things. About, okay, yeah, I've always thought it was one of two things. Either complacency, they got really good, and they're like, yeah, I'm comfortable. I'm just going to go on tour, play all my hit songs, and that's it. Or lightning in a bottle. Like, that's mm. that was all. Like, you could only capture it once. It was so good. They wrote it at this time where they were just so raw in their lives, and the work came out perfectly, and the music and the melody, and it just came together, and it was just too impossible to recreate. That's my guess. Derek, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not an expert in that field, but I would guess that um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll is not sustainable. That's a hard lifestyle. I think that <laughs> they run it hard and they burn hot and fast. And like, you know, it's it's kind of um, one and done. The shelf life of creativity is very short. Yeah, though they're mm -hmm. art, they're extreme artists. You know, it's it's um, it would be hard to maintain that lifestyle even uh, minus that first piece, just the life on the road away from your family. I mean, that, that's that got to be fun at first. But as you get older, I could see that you build a nice nest egg, hopefully do well for yourself financially, and you don't have to grind. I'm sure there's some lesson we can learn from this that if they wouldn't have got so caught up in the lifestyle or anything other than the art itself, right? If you're, if you're making music because you want groupies or you want sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it's not going to last. But if you're making music because you love the art, or you love making people happy, you love living the gifts that God gave you, uh, maybe that's going to be different, right? It might be actually be more sustainable. And there could be a lesson there now that you've brought it full circle. 
for the same thing applying to motivation to build wealth. If you want wealth so that you can finally have significance, you can finally stick it to your in-laws who never thought you were good enough. You can you can finally uh, feel like you're more important than other people or get a, a, a car that shows your neighbors who's boss. It probably isn't going to sustain you to keep growing. But if you want wealth because you want to help more people, you'll stay motivated. You'll stay in the game. At least that's something I'm going to be thinking about. Nice. Kyle has the mac and cheese. Mac and cheese is You're in not and we're good. Okay. Timer is set. Now we're good. All right. So where do you think we should start here? So Derek, uh, you're the ADU guy, and that's what your name is, that ADU guy. For the people who are maybe here hanging out with us tonight that don't even know what an ADU is, what are the what is an ADU? What are the perks of putting an ADU in, on your property? And, and maybe tell us just a little bit about your experience uh, with your investments and your ADUs. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kyle. So an, an ADU, for all intents and purposes, is an additional dwelling unit on a lot that was primarily designated for a single family house. How rapidly zoning laws are changing right now um, really sets the tone for what that definition is. It used to be a second smaller dwelling on a single family lot. Now we're able to do multiple ADUs on the same lot, depending on legislation in your state. Uh, but it's basically taking single family zoning and turning it into a small multifamily development, either through attached living spaces, detached living spaces, and so on and so forth. It's kind of a niche strategy. You know, I like to say that I'm um, an inch wide and miles deep, but I've ex exclusively focused on this um, since 1997. I built my first ADU, and now it's kind of my life's work to teach other people how to achieve financial freedom one unit at a time with this fairly simple, repeatable strategy. And just to you know, maybe tie into something David just recently said on on his last episode was, you know, you want to get to boring, you know, when you, when you get to something that's really, really boring, like it, you want to either teach somebody else how to do it and go start something else, or you just keep doing it. And, you know, honestly, what I tell people is I, I've just been doing this for so long that it's super boring. And that's kind of where I know uh, how I know I'm in the right spot. So now it's all about teaching other people how to do it. I have a goal to influence 1 million ADUs in my lifetime. And I plan to live a long time. So I'm an open book. I, I hope we have a lot of your followers that are going to be asking questions specific to their properties or properties they're looking to buy. Um, and I'm okay with touching on planning, designing, financing, building, and holding ADUs. So fair game. So I've heard you talk in the past a little bit about putting on ADU goggles when looking for a property, right? And what are what are some some steps that people should be taking or thinking about when they they look at it through look at a property through that lens of like, hey, does an ADU work for this property or not? Yeah, it always is going to start with zoning. So if you already own a property, you're going to be quite limited, but call, email, and go into your local planning department, build a relationship there. They're the decision makers. They're the goalkeepers. They're going to be giving you conditions and approvals. So get to know the zoning officials in either the area where your property is, or if you're long distance real estate investing in an area that you want to purchase in. Um, so it always starts with zoning. You, you need to uh, make sure that you can deploy this strategy legally because we're building a business. We're not just trying to you know, stack up a bunch of rentals that aren't really rentals. Uh, that's okay when we get started and, and legacy ADUs are how a lot of people um, get into uh, real estate. Very similar model would be a, a house hack roommate situation, um, but we're looking for zoning. So that's what I'm looking for first and foremost. Uh, after that, I'm looking for uh, the strategy that best fits me and my needs. In my case, in my market, I like detached standalone new build ADUs. So I would be looking for properties with a large flat lot with current infrastructure. I like houses that are 1970 and newer. Um, if you're a first time home buyer, I would recommend you're looking for a house that's a four three that you can easily convert to a three two and a one one. Um, if you're looking to age in place and you're you know in your 50s or 60s, I'd be looking at a potential garage conversion because it's most likely a slab on grade and we can build and design that with age in place principles. So really, I would ask you what your goals are and when we would work from there. And a lot of people in our business, they want to they want to start with how much can you spend or how much are you qualified for? 
um, or what ROI I would you like? And I, I really take the position of like, let's just look at your goals and then go from there. But um, zoning, infrastructure, um, grade, how level is the lot, and then location. And so I talk a lot about the three things that that are really important to me and my clientele who are my tenants, which is um, location, privacy, and amenities. And location is the one thing that no amount of time or money will change. So uh, if we're looking at goals, I always try to start with location and then and then work down the check sheet from there. Cool. And, and by the way, um, you are in one of your ADUs right now where you're filming from, correct? Um, yeah, this, this would qualify as an accessory dwelling unit, yes. Very nice. So for those of you that don't know, he, that is not a Zoom background. That is actually a real, a real uh, a building that he's in. Um, so, like, what, what, were, what are some of the benefits to building an ADU on a property? Why would somebody look to do that in the first place? Well, one reason that you could consider the ADU strategy is if you already own the house, you have a free lot. And it's important to talk about the value of your land because in the Midwest, this may not make sense. If you're on the coasts or you're in an area with a university or a hospital system and there's a high demand for rental property, uh, there's a pretty low barrier of entry if you already own free dirt. So I like to tell people, um, you know, the, the closest, the best place to invest is, is where you know. And usually people think, well, that's the market I'm in or the market I grew up in or the market I've purchased in before. And if you zoom in even further, it's, it's like the house that you live in. So... Uh, if you're a first time investor or a newer investor, another great strategy uh, of using your own free lot is it's kind of a crash course into being a landlord as well. So those are a couple of the things that um, I tr try to keep um, top of mind. So let me let me run a scenario by it. <clears throat> so I live in California. The, the land is usually worth more than, say, places in the Midwest. I have an acre of land. Um, most of it is just vacant it's, and it's flat. It's perfect. But from my knowledge of when I bought the house about a year and a half ago, there's some old like CCNRs from, I don't know, the 1960s or 70s when the, the houses were originally built that said you cannot have an accessory dwelling unit on the property. Are you seeing, especially with in places like California where the ADU laws are changing, sometimes those CCNRs could potentially be overturned? I actually have some neighbors that have seem to have ADUs and don't have any issues, but that doesn't want to build something then you know have it get pulled down or something like that yeah yeah awesome point there so i would say um look at your not only your your local zoning code but look at your state legislation so i i happen to know you personally i know that you're in california i know that there's really really strong state legislation that's supporting infill strategies including adus some really big Senate bills that are that are earth shattering. Nobody really has jumped on how big Senate Bill 8 and 9 could potentially be if, if all the kinks are worked out. Um, but a lot of the state legislation is going to override your particular CCNRs or whatever your homeowner association may say. So you need to educate yourself. In California, there's a great resource. Any of the listeners right now that live in California, the Casita Coalition is a professional group that represents homeowners. A lot of their services are free. Um, and they can help you so you're not going at it alone when you go into some of these battles. If you're in areas where states don't have super strong legislation, and I, I deal with with clients often who are uh, in the short term rental market that are dealing with this where CCNRs or associations won't allow them. And the same is for ADUs in states with weak legislation is join the board, get a seat at the table. You know, if you can get on your committee and you can make changes at the local level in your neighborhood, there's a lot of CCNRs that aren't enforced. There's a lot of homeowner associations that have something in their bylaws, but they choose not to follow. If you have an inner working of that association because you're a member, you're going to have um, a better chance of not like imposing your will, but at least educating people. And as you were nodding your head, I kind of um, remembered one thing I should have said on your last question is why would you build an ADU where you're at? If it's your primary residence and you're building an ADU there, there's, depending on the financing option you use, if you're taking equity out of the house, um, there's some really beneficial tax advantages of um, borrowing money against the property you have to put into improvements on the same tax lot where you can write off interest and whatnot. Um, just, just something that kind of, uh, came to me as you were nodding your head and smiling. Thank you for that. You're welcome. 
Um, yeah, that's really good information. That's something I definitely want to um, pursue and look into a little bit more. And that's something I think a lot of people don't realize is that you can, you the CCNRs can potentially be trumped by the, the new laws that have been coming out. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity that can be had there. Yes. Yeah. And the flow chart, you know, I look at everything kind of on a flow chart checklist. And the way I would go is I would approach the association. Hey, these are my preliminary plans. Would you support this? Um, the next step after that would be trying to to join the board to maybe um, change policy. And then after that, it would be not threatening legislation, but hey, are you guys aware of this new law that just passed? And then below that would be um, land use attorney letter to association saying, hey, you guys are not following the law. And we just like to kindly remind you that this is an allowable use. You know, I believe there's case law of <clears throat> uh, state legislator or federal legislation superseding CCNRs with, uh, like Americans with Disability Act stuff. So a lot of HOAs will say we, we don't allow residential assisted living facilities and owners have been able to go in there and say you're discriminating against people with disabilities by doing that. You are not allowed to have that law and they've won. So that does happen where certain things come in and trump other things. There's things in the contract that your agent can write that are not, I say that they're in the contract. They're not in the contract but like the, the rule about how long you have to review disclosures is not contractually agreed upon. It is state law. You have X, X amount of days to review your disclosures. I think it's seven days or so. Kyle, does that sound right? Yeah. I think in California, it's seven. Yeah. At one point I knew that um, to review disclosures. And if you have not had them delivered, you can back out using that law. There's nothing in the contract that can prohibit them from doing that. So that's one of the ways that we've represented clients by just understanding these different governing bodies of law. Where I'll say, okay, no inspection contingency. Uh, we'll go in on the house, and they didn't give us disclosures all, all right off the bat. So by the time that they did give them to us, we had three days or seven days, whatever it was, to review those disclosures, and we backed out based off of something that was in the disclosures, not mm. necessarily whatever came from the report. So that mm. happens quite a bit when you're talking about things that could be decided in a court of law. I think that's really wise counsel to understand that there's different levels of law that will supersede a CCNR. Yeah. Yeah. Great point, David. And I'll say this, and this is probably the most valuable thing that I'll say tonight is the, the hybrid model of what we think an additional dwelling is and what's an allowable use in the zone. And I, a perfect example is a project I'm just wrapping up right now where I'm in a multifamily zone. I already have multiple properties on the lot. The city said no to an ADU, just like a association would say no. And th this hybrid ADU model, which is super, super valuable, is where you build ba a basic, for all intents and purposes, an ADU, but you don't put a stove in it. A lot of jurisdictions will allow you to use plug-in 110-volt countertop appliances. And the difference uh, and why it's a hybrid is most people just avoid planning and zoning and permits, and they just do it. Well, what we can do now is we can legally do it. So we permit the space as either attached or detached living space. Think of it as an addition. We don't put a full kitchen in it because it doesn't have a 220 amp mm -hmm. plug or a three quarter inch natural gas line. And we don't put a conventional stove oven combo in, but we do a kitchenette with, uh, you know, a full size fridge. If you would like a full size sink, you could even put a dishwasher in and then you would have a plug in like two burner induction hot top. And the strategy that I like is I, I, I've got a product that I've used a lot. That's a, a great product. It's a two burner induction hot top that actually gets countersunk into the granite countertop. So it looks like a super high end glass cooktop. Anyways, you get fully permitted, you get inspected, you get a certificate of occupancy, and it doesn't matter what the NIMBY neighbors say. It doesn't matter what your association says. It may not matter what your state or your county has to say. So that's um, for people listening. If you're in an area where you can't do an ADU and you've already done your research, that doesn't mean that you can't do attached or detached living space without a kitchen that lives as a standalone property. Wow. That's all I was going to say, which is wow, Kyle. I, that's <laughs> coming. Uh, I love it. <clears throat> so, and I get this question a lot there. So I'm kind of curious what your, your stance is. What, what does the financing look like? on a property that you're buying that already has an ADU on it. Sometimes I've heard there's a difference between if it's attached, if it's detached, it might be considered a duplex, which is a different kind of financing. What mm -hmm. should the typical buyer who's out there looking for a property 
um, be looking for when there's an ADU on the property and, and what should they take into consideration when it comes to financing? So I would be looking for properties that are designated as single family houses with ADUs. Uh, the first line on the flow chart is, is it in a single family or a multifamily zone? Because that's going to be a lot easier to argue. Uh, the next line down on the flow chart is um, go to the city archives and see what it was permitted as, because we're looking to usually buy permitted ADUs. And I'll just say real quickly that, I mean, building ADUs for 30 years, I'm currently buying properties with ADUs because it's easier and it's more cost effective mm -hmm. and they're easier to finance. So um, this is something that I don't just talk about. I'm currently doing and acting on um, as we speak. So I'm looking for single family properties with accessory dwelling units where I can potentially get financing as um, owner occupied for one a year. So what we're looking to do is buy with 5% down in a really high market. And we can't do that if it's designated as a duplex. Um, there's some there's some strategies if you're um, going after an FHA loan uh, where you can buy with low percent down on a duplex, but traditionally you're going to be depending on the lender, 15 to 20 to 25% down on a duplex. So I'm always looking for single family houses with ADUs. There's some um, discrepancies that I've seen and I've been, I've actually experienced. And some of those are um, two power meters. So if there's two power meters, the appraiser may call that a duplex. A lot of it has to do with how it's written up in the appraisal and then how it's underwritten. So what I always do is do my own due diligence to try to find houses with ADUs as opposed to duplexes and triplexes. And then I am able to not coach really the, the appraiser, but just say, hey, here's the data. During my due diligence period, I pulled up the original application for the planning action in 1990 for a single family house with an ADU. This is a, an ADU attached or detached. It doesn't matter. I just don't want the duplex designation when it comes to financing. There are strategies where um, like in California, if you're looking to do a lot split um, and do a fee simple lot and basically buy a property with two structures and turn it into two sellable properties, you might want to buy it with the financing that, benefits you the most and then call it a duplex once you're done. So it's really knowing how the appraisal and lending system works and different lenders are going to tell you different things. I mean, David, I, I've listened to pretty much everything you and Christian have done and you speak of this a lot too, is it, it can depend on the lender, de uh, depend on the appraisal, can depend on underwriting. But the easy answer is I'm looking for something that I can prove has an ADU, not a duplex, because I'm going to have to put less down. If you're an investor and you're buying these um, all over the country with investment loans, it may not matter as much to you whether it's designated as a single family with an ADU or as a duplex. By the way, seeing a few questions in here, Roberto, Nick, about ADUs, text it to the number below, 833-777-0309, and come in and chat with Derek. Um, I, paused, you guys, but you're... I paused real quick there, David. I thought you were going to drop some serious lending knowledge on us. Not some serious <laughs> knowledge, because <clears throat> I don't want to overwhelm YouTube, but I believe <laughs> that you can still do uh, an FHA loan on a mm -hmm. duplex, triplex, or fourplex at yeah. three and a half percent down, but all the conventional options for the most part have gone away. Don't hold me to this. If my memory serves correctly, I think you can get a conventional loan on a duplex at 10%, but triplexes and fourplexes are getting into 15 to 20. Does that sound right, Derek? Yeah, you're... yeah, that's correct. Some will do 10%, not many. Most people will tell you no, but there are lenders that will do it. And something that's worth noting on that same topic is, um, and I just, remembered this was and it's only been about 60 maybe 90 days ago that um, Freddie Fannie changed their regulation and now allow QM mortgages to count ADU income 75% of income rental income towards DTI which is huge that's basically underwriting a property like you would a duplex or a triplex and that's a brand new um, that's a brand new policy when it comes to QM mortgages or QM. So that's something that's really valuable that we didn't have even three months ago. So one more reason why an ADU is maybe a better strategy than a duplex. And I, I talk about this often 
whenever asked, but the, the goal, um, your goal may not be this, but what I'm looking for and a lot of the people I work with are looking for is they're looking for the small town kind of single family neighborhood feel and getting into multifamily there. And the other benefit of buying a, a primary house with an ADU is you're, you're usually in a more, I'm not going to say it's a better neighborhood, um, but you're, you're in a single family neighborhood as, a, as opposed to a more high density, tighter and taller neighborhood. So an, another reason to look for ADUs over duplexes if your goals align with that. So oh, if we sum that up, what you're saying is if you go for a pure duplex, you're going to get a worse loan. If you go with a single family home with an ADU, you can still get away with the 5% down options. Yes. Yeah. You're going to get a better loan and you're going to get in, you're, you're going to be in a better area most of the time. I mean, that's a great point. I, don't let me uh, lose your guys' thoughts, by the way, when I interject here, but I've said this often and it just never gets picked up and run with. When you house hack a single family home, you almost always get in a better location, which is better for all of real estate. That's the three rules of real estate. Not every city is the same. So it depends on how your city was developed. But when you look at the architecture of how cities are come to pass, if they were, if it's a track home area where they tend to sell off a big parcel of land and build a bunch of homes at one time, this is most California markets. The city zones specific parts of the city for different types of housing. This is zone for R1 is typically what it would be called single family homes. This is R2. You can have two doors on the same property <clears throat> and so forth. Most cities take the worst part of town, throw all the small multifamily into there, and it becomes a petri dish of problems. This is where you don't have any pride of ownership. It's all tenants that are living there. It usually ends up being more crime. It's Your properties don't go up in value as much. If you have a single family home in that area, it's rough. Nobody wants to be there. Versus if you can get a single family home in an area that's zoned for R1 or doesn't allow small multifamily, it's going to appreciate quite a bit more. So when you're just looking at the spreadsheet, which is kind of where I've been take an aim most of the time, like the parts that get people in trouble with real estate is they just look at a spreadsheet. The cash on cash return will look much better on that triplex in the bad part of town. When you look at the actual tax returns of the people that have owned real estate for five years, that triplex is not doing well when the single family houses are. The exception to this is if you're in an area more like the South where they tend to not build track homes. They don't just build them all at one time. You buy a lot you build your home on that lot. In my experience, those areas tend to say all types of property, four units or below, as long as they meet code are okay. So you can get four single family homes, a triplex, another single family home, another single family home, a duplex. Like when they're mixed in like that, you avoid that Petri dish problem. You don't have mm -hmm. all small multifamily in the same point. It's a better way to do stuff where you're kind of mixing single family with small multifamily. You got a little bit of tenants, but you got majority of homeowners. You don't get the crime problems because you don't have all of the same element in the same place. They're like mixed apart, right? Like if you're out there looking for trouble and you're messing with people's homes that they own, that's going to get shut down pretty quick versus the landlords don't have any idea what's happening in that neighborhood they're they're graffitiing everywhere they're breaking windows that type of thing so yeah i agree with you that what you're saying is like yeah. you'll usually get the better location if you go for the the single family house with yeah. zoning with the adu yeah yeah awesome points and and i'll i'll kind of interject this that i look at my my goal and my um my process as from a tenant's point of view like growing up as a tenant being a tenant, talking to lots and lots of tenants. I mean, they're my clients and I, I talk to them every day. And when you're in an area with um, more higher densities, you know, like, you know, where you ran most of your calls when you were a cop, David, they weren't in the houses with big backyards. They were in closer to transit and closer to the train station and closer to the bus station and, yep. and whatnot. Um, but the tenants that I talk to, this is a, an ADU is a one, one or a two, one, or maybe a two, two, but most of the time my bread and butter is a standalone one, one. So all my tenants that I'm talking to all the competition, everything that they've looked at, lived in or called on is in these higher dense areas. So when they come to, to one of our properties and they look at it, it's absolutely night and day difference. So we're, we're building up or buying a product that's really 
high demand and low supply. So that's the biggest difference is it's not just like, what's the headache factor, as you would say, David, I, I'm not looking at the spreadsheet. This is a, this is a way less headache factor because it's in a better part of town. I'm going to have more appreciation and a better tenant that never calls me and stays for four years. It's like, what is the tenant going to think when they show up? Well, they're going to show up and they're going to think this looks nothing like what it would have been or looked at and I will take it all day long. So that's the biggest advantage. And people say to me all the time, Derek, why would I spend a hundred grand when I could just go buy another house? Because I would tell them you're not going to get the same quality of tenant. You're not going to get the same, still semi-passive. I'm not saying I'm a complete passive investor, but uh, a brand new, new built product for one person in a good area is the most passive real estate investment I've ever seen. And I'll, I'll argue with anybody about that. There's several good points there. The first says that you're saying, which is a very solid point, or maybe you're not saying it, but it's implied in my understanding of what you're saying, that not every single property works the same way. So if you have a $70,000 property in a rough area, building a $100,000 ADU is probably not wise. Buy a whole house for $100,000. If you've got a great location that's going to appreciate over time, adding an ADU to that property is incredibly wise. So this isn't a rubber stamp that you just go to every single property like people want to think, right? Mm -mm, Real not at all. More, more beautiful than that. This is art. How do you make this property more valuable, right? How do you get this tenant in here? And then another point you said, which is in line with what I've been talking about a lot, it's just kind of opposite of all my contemporaries that want to teach you. Guys, if you're listening to this, if you're one of the 68 people that are here live right now, if you're watching this afterwards, please just hear me out. What salesmen are putting in front of you is rarely ever what is in your best interest. Okay. Like the people that are saying, come take my course. I'm going to teach you this slick trick to make money in real estate. It never is something that the, the guys I know, the people in GoBundance, the wealthy people I know, they don't look for slick tricks. Nobody does that. Bill Belichick isn't trying to figure out how to run a run pass option or a wildcat offense or some new gimmick. Bill Belichick is saying, how do I make my football team as good as they can possibly be? And if we come across a gimmick that works, we'll take advantage of it. But we're not putting our, our efforts into doing that. Bill Belichick, would, in this case, analogy, is a very good football coach that runs a very good football team. Uh, shoot, I did this and I do this all the time. I make such a good point that I lose a train of thought that I had. I will come back to it. Derek, you were just spitting such good facts that, oh, supply and demand. No one talks about supply and demand, okay? My contemporaries want to teach you about a new sleek trick. These gurus in the space that want you to spend a bunch of money to take their course. They want to make real estate seem complicated so that you have to pay money to them to learn how to do it. It is incredibly simple when you do it well. If you can do what Derek said, buy an area with high demand and constricted supply. That alone, you just made money. You're going to continue to make money. You can't lose. If you buy assets of any type, that have growing demand or high demand with low supply or constricted supply, the value will go up and you will be able to pick who you want to sell or rent to, which is what you were getting at there, Derek. Like if you have the thing everybody wants, you have more applicants to choose from and therefore you will get better tenants and therefore you will not hate being a landlord. You want to have these horrible stories of real estate that other people have, okay? Furthermore, when you raise the rent and the tenant's like, I don't know if I want to pay this. They're not going to play chicken with you because they know there's 20 other people that will gladly pay that rent to live in that great location. Conversely, when you go for the easy way in, the not the good neighborhood, the cheapest house you could find, the multifamily in the, in the rough spot, and there's not a whole lot of people that want to live there, and you got to, like the tenants have the leverage, you just need someone that will rent it, and the only people willing to live there are going to be a problem for you, You've given up control of your business. You've given up agency over your own wealth building. You take what they'll give you. You are not in the driver's seat in that position, okay? And these are all important things when it comes to wealth building that do not get talked about because there's nowhere on a spreadsheet to put this information. But it's powerful. Like you look at Dr. Joe who does Section 8 in Washington, D.C. He makes the best properties he possibly can for the purpose of getting as many applicants as he can. He chooses the top one and they live there for 20 years. Is no turnover and the rents keep going up because section eight keeps going up. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's the way of, of taking leverage. This is why location is so important because if you have an asset, no matter how many units it has rent out and nobody wants it, 
oh, you're just always going for a tenant. They stop paying rent after six months. Now you got a victim. The eviction process takes five months. You finally get them out. It takes a month and a half to get it ready. You lose all your money. You put another person in there. You repeat the same cycle. ADUs are a way that you can get into the best location, get the best equity, and still have it cash flow. And I, I wanted to take a uh, what would have been a summary of what you said, Derek, but I expanded on it quite a bit there because it's so important to recognize that, right? This is not a solution that works for every property, but you shouldn't be trying to buy every property. If you bought a $70,000 pig and you're thinking about putting an ADU in it to make it make sense, don't. Get rid of it. Sell it even at a loss. Put that money into a good location. Build the ADU on that property. And 10 years later, you will look back and be very grateful that you attended YouTube Live on a Friday night. Amen, brother. All right, Kyle. I'm going to step off my soapbox there. <laughs> no problem. All right, Derek. We actually got a few questions for you. <clears throat> There's a few people coming in, but we've got... Uh, Lacey here who has a question, particularly around uh, calculating, you know, how and, and, you know, estimating how much an ABU will actually add to the resale value of a home. So welcome, Lacey. Uh, would you mind? Uh, did I, did I get your question correct there? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just curious how you calculate, you know, how much adding an ABU to your property will add. Is that kind of based on the cash flow it creates? Or, you know, if I go to sell my house, How's that going to add to the value? Yeah, good questions, Lacey. I'm assuming that's for me. Sorry, I, I shouldn't have jumped yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it's not going to be based on what it's made, uh, what it makes, like a commercial model. It's going to be usually the cost sales comparison approach. Um, but if you're trying to estimate what kind of value it will bring, I'll give you um, my, my top three. The first is going to be look for comps in your area. Nobody's going to do better homework protecting your money than you. Uh, the second mm -hmm. would be to pay an appraiser, pay them for their time. Hey, sir, ma'am, can I pay you $300 to give you an opinion of value on these plans at this address? And maybe do that to two people. I mean, if, if you have to spend $600 to save yourself a $50,000 loss on a burr, that's great money spent. And then the third option, which is kind of the back of the napkin math, is take 75% of the appraised value of your current house per square foot and then apply that to the potential ADU considering that it's built with the with similar finishings. So what I okay. see people do a lot um, is they build a super custom ADU in the backyard of a median price point house in a median price point neighborhood and then they're bummed out when they don't get their value back out it's either like on putting sale. some fifteen thousand dollar rims on your twelve thousand dollar <laughs> civic and saying is it now a thirty thousand dollar car yeah. yeah yeah so look look for comps um pay okay. two different appraisers even if it's three hundred dollars each for them to look at your plans and giving them give you an opinion and then you know if you have a, a house that's roughly $300 a square foot, and you're going to build a thousand square foot ADU, you would assume that you can get 75% of that. And that's conservative. Um, and that's considering, you know, you, you, you take your time to plan, design and finance uh, and build an ADU that's efficient. It's really easy to overbuild these because there's no economy of scale. Sure. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. What market are you in, Lacey? I'm in North Idaho. Oh, okay. Yeah. Idaho is a tough one. I've done some work for some people um, up there. It's uh, the reason I ask yeah. is because it's a lot easier to value an ADU if you live in San Francisco or Portland, Oregon. Um, sure. Or... I know I'm on property and I already have a building that's kind of a storage building. It's got a foundation, electricity. I've been considering converting it to an ADU, but I wasn't sure what it would do to the value. Mm, yeah, yeah. You will you won't get as many excited appraisers as you would in an area that has a lot of them, but I would still call, sure. I would call all your local appraisers. They'll take your call for free and then offer to pay them fat to review okay. your plans. Yeah, it sounds like a good investment. <laughs> Lisa, you're asking such a good question there. I really like what Thanks. you're saying. Um, the, the, Derek's answer was spot on especially the specifics he gave of 75% of the value of the square footage yeah. that you have. Cause when you're adding an ADU, as far as how much it affects the value to you, the cash flow is very important, but how much it affects the value to the appraiser. They're basically looking at the square footage because that's what the next buyer is going to care about. Cause most people aren't investors. So yeah. another way to look at that would be if this is a 1200 square foot house, you're going to get significant value because the price per square foot on those is much lower. 
and the practical mm -hmm. use of adding more square footage to a 1200 square foot house is high. You're getting more bang for your buck. If you've got a 6,000 square foot house or a 4,500 square foot house, you're adding another thousand square feet of an ADU. Comparatively speaking, it's not going to be worth quite as much. So mm -hmm. this is just a good, I just wanted to jump in there. That's a good principle for real estate investing in general. Adding square footage is a great way to add value to a property, even if the finishing is already done. Not, not, not every upgrade mm -hmm. needs to be cosmetic, but mm -hmm. when you've already got 3,700 square feet or unless every other house around it is 6,000 square feet, but I don't know many, any areas that work that way. When it's already a yeah. big house with a lot of, of uh, square footage, the ADU is going to see diminished returns. Okay. Yeah, I was curious. My house is pretty large and I'm on property. So I imagine if I did resell, the person would probably use it as a guest house. So that's not so worth as much to a that person like, that's looking yeah. like a guest house isn't as important. It's nice, but it's not like, wow. Versus yeah. let's say that you were on the beach in Malibu with an 1100 yeah. square foot home. And now you yeah. went and added a 900 square foot ADU. You've almost doubled the size of your home. And, and made, that's the type of real estate that ideally that you're going to get the most bang sure. for your buck with it. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Speaking of houses with ADUs on the beach, uh, I saw a property. I was walking on the beach with my kids the other day, and there's a there's a property with three units on it, and uh, they're asking only seven million. So I don't know, David, if you want to me, you and Derek want to go in on that together. You know, it could be a nice little cash cow. They had three units on the beach in San Diego. Yeah, seven million. One for each of us. Yeah, I'm in. How, how big were the <laughs> units? I don't know. I didn't look into it a ton, but one of them was like literally on the sand. It's pretty cool looking. Yeah. Mm. Could we Seven add any more? Million. Was my first my first thought was, can we add any more? Yeah. <laughs> if you could build it's up, on maybe. this like steep hill. Well, mm. the problem, yeah, you'd have to build up because it's on the steep hill. It's one of those ones where it actually has like an elevator or a hill elevator that goes down to get down to the bottom unit and stuff. It's pretty crazy. So it's going to be underwater in twenty years. There's no way to, you can't, well you can't back the house be. up at all. Uh, yeah. Location, 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 yep. until it washes away, guys. Yes. That'll be part of the lost city um, of Atlantis. That's awesome. <laughs> so uh, next person we have here is uh, Lindsay. And Lindsay, if you don't mind turning on your camera, turning it back on, we'll, we'll bring you on here. But her question is a little bit uh, of a longer one, so bear with me. But she's basically saying she's, she's house hacking a duplex where the units are detached. She has some green space in between in between each unit where she's thinking to possibly construct an ADU. She called her city planning department and they said that since the units are detached, the second unit is considered to be an ADU. So if she wants to add another unit, it would be have to be a 500 square foot junior ADU. Any advice on how to move forward with financing or other things to consider? Not sure if it would make her property more valuable. Lindsay, welcome to the show. Did I uh, encapsulate your question pretty well there? Very well. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate it. You going right, to swing at that one, David? I'm going to start it and then first? I'm going to throw it to Derek because I think that'll be a better approach. The first thing I would wonder is can you get the thing permitted not as an ADU, but can you join those two units together to turn them into one bigger property have it now reclassified as instead of two detached units, one unit, which would then allow you to build an ADU as your second thing. Have you looked into that? I would say no, because they're so far apart that the only green space is in the middle of them. Oh, how far apart are they? Uh, I don't know. I would say like maybe like 15 feet apart, 12 feet. I just from a construction standpoint, Derek, if you just extended a roof across them, did it very cheap, put a concrete pad, like tore down the walls so that it was connected or put doors on each end of what would be the exterior of the property. Like a is, could you do that relatively cheap to combine those? And B, do you think the city would approve the permits if you did? Yes. And yes. And that's where my mind went to was the the negative. I, I know you're in California because you use JADU terminology and that's for people listening that don't understand or don't know that. So a junior ADU is, pretty much specific to the state of California. And it's a 500 square foot max ADU within the perimeter of your existing structure. It could be an attached garage. So the negative about it, and, and there can be an additional hundred and something square foot for ingress and egress, but we just call them 500 square feet. The negative to that, uh, it, it's a positive because it's the second one. Um, but the negative is it's small and it has to be within that first house. So I, I was right in line with David, like how do you do a change of use from the ADU you already have um, apply for a change of use to convert that to some kind of 
primary or you know the the main house usually um you want a primary house because an adu what makes it accessory is it's it's an accessory to the primary to the main so if you could connect those two together um that's that seems pretty simple to me a lot of it's going to de depend on roof pitches you can always attach two buildings all day long where you run into problems is how much engineering is the roof going to need to connect to the other roof from point a to point B. But another great strategy, I mean, what I'm hearing is you have two units and you have a big flat open spot in the middle where you want a third one. Is that right? Correct. And the city is saying no, unless it's a JADU, that's not helping you because it's going to have to be within one of those others. Um, right. I would say, look at the detached living space strategy where you build five, six, seven, 800 square feet. It has everything that a standalone dwelling would have with the exception of a 220 volt range or a gas oven. And a lot of jurisdictions are allowing kitchenettes with plug-in appliances. And if you were listening earlier, one of the things I mentioned was like this, it's not even a workaround or a gray area. It's, it's a great infill housing strategy. And if you can't do an ADU or you can't do a duplex or triplex, um, you can look into that. Can you build a standalone detached living space that has eating, sleeping, living, sanitation, and cooking ability without a stove. So um, he did mention the city planner when I spoke with him, he mentioned something about, um, since it would have to be like a smaller uh, living space, he did mention something about a kitchenette. So I don't know if he was kind of going towards what you were talking about or yeah, yeah maybe I had to clarify, but. Yeah, I yeah, I would just say, hey, can I build a standalone detached living space with a kitchenette um, and one thing I have noticed over the years in a market that has a lot of those and, and having done a lot of those is there's a slight reduction in rent. So if you have a 700 square foot one, one ADU with a full kitchen, the only difference is it has a range. It might be, um, it might attract 10% more, uh, demand 10% higher rents than you would with a kitchenette that doesn't have an oven, but you have to know your tenant intimately. And if you, rent to university students or, tr or, or traveling nurses or young professionals, how many turkeys do they cook on Thanksgiving? Well, probably very few because they go home. It's not a, a deal breaker for a lot of people. What's, what's going to really make them want that is it's a standalone unit in the middle of this cute green space, you know? So that's, that's kind of how I would answer that. Um, if you can't connect the two to make one and free up your detached ADU, look into doing a detached living space. And I like to be direct with the planner. Hey, can I build something just like an ADU without a stove? Okay. And yeah, my plan was, cause I, I live close to Rutland university. So my plan was to rent out that space to a student. Um, Wonderful. As far as, so like financing, just a little bit of, you had mentioned something about 5% down, but if that was like, uh, if you had a detached ADU in a single family home, how would financing go? For example, a standalone, uh, living space. Is that what a county? What county are you in in California? San Bernardino. Okay. Um, do you have equity in the properties? I haven't got it appraised since I bought it, but I do have some equity. I'm just not sure how, specifically how much. Do you have cash reserves that you could build it with? Not entirely. Do you have somebody that you can partner with to provide the cash? Yes. Perhaps. Yeah, I I would potentially look at that for some applicable federal rate family um, not to qualify as gift loan money. Okay. Uh, I was going to say call um, Redwood Credit Union. Okay. They're they're lending and I think they're up to eight or nine counties and only in California right now. And they have a 9010 LTV based on finished appraised value loan. And then there's a fund, a grant fund in California that actually covers the gap funding from construction loan to completion refi. So I would ask them if they're servicing your area. I don't think they go that far south, but if anybody's listening and they're in the central California, Northern California area, um, that's the best product I've ever seen to build a new ADU. Got it. Do you have someone like a, someone specific in the credit union? like a person? No, no, I don't. I, I don't. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you, Derek, Kyle, and David. Thank you very much. Lindsay, if for some reason you can't build it at minimum, buy a trailer, hook it up to septic, back it up in that space and start writing that thing out. I you got of that. Of that. <laughs> yeah. Great idea. Mm. Thank you.
Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. See ya. David, I was waiting for you to like jump in and again, drop a bunch of wisdom on her, like low and no money down and, and go at it. I didn't mean to take that one. <laughs> No, I, that's what you're here for. You're here to, to take a lot of it. I was just trying to compliment you there. I'm glad we were thinking the same way because here's what I find a lot of the time. You talk to an attorney and you're like, can I do this? And their answer is no, because you could get in trouble. You talk to an accountant. Can I do this? No, you get in a lot of trouble. You talk to a contractor. Hey, can you join these together? No, it'd be too expensive. Then you ask a question. All right, attorney, what if I did it this way? No, nah, I suppose you could probably do that. All right, CPA, what if I what if I uh, uh, classified it like this? Oh, yeah, I guess that would work. That'd be fine. That happens all the time where people tell you no and you get discouraged and then you ask one question, let alone two or three. And the answer is, oh, yeah, you can. Because they're not working to solve your problem. They're working to make themselves money. And if you bring them a problem that's difficult, they're not going to solve it. But if you solve your problem, they are more than happy to take your money to go execute it. So when you're talking to contractors like this, like you brought up a very good point, it would be, it'd be tricky to get the roof pitches to line up. They're going to tell you that the next question should be, how could we do it? That it wouldn't be tricky. And I swear, I don't know why it opens up stuff in people's brains and they start thinking, they go, well, you know what you could do. And the minute you hear those words, you've hit pay dirt. Like every time I hear a contractor say, well, you know what you could do? What's about to follow is going to be a really good strategy that's going to save me a lot of money. So one of the things when I'm talking to them is you just have to understand they're not typically creative. It's like, tell me what you want and I will, and their brain is thinking about what it would look like to do it, not what's the best way to do it. What's the cheapest way to do it? Is there a better way to do it? It's just like, literally, where would I put trusses is what they're thinking. You got to get them out of that. Yeah. Your attorney's thinking, uh, this could get me in trouble. I have to tell him no, right? You got to get them out of that kind of thinking and into, well, what would need to be done for that to be legal? What would it have to look like? And I can't tell you how many professionals have partnered with me, and I'm not a specialist in any degree, but I will ask questions that then they will realize this can work, and then they will tell all of their other clients this great strategy that they claim that they came up with that just came from me asking a question in a different way. So that is very true of contractors, and I want to encourage you guys there's probably a way to make that roof situation work. And if you ask enough questions, they'll realize it. And if they can't, bring in a different one. That person might have seen things in their career different than the first one you talked to. They might have experience in something or they might know a really good roof person who has had to make something like this happen. And go, oh, yeah, we could do that. It wouldn't be nearly that much money. We would just do it this way. Um, I think as investors, we when you rely on a spreadsheet, it's either the numbers say yes or the numbers say no, and that's all you're looking at. You're not looking at it creatively. And so a lot of the trades work that way. And I just want to encourage everybody when you're in those positions to not take no for an answer so easily. Any comments on that, Derek? Because I know you work in construction a lot too. Yeah, you just, you nailed it. And I mean, that's why you run the most successful real estate podcast in the world, David, is because you, you ask really good questions. And you're an amazing investor because you've asked a lot of amazing investors really good questions. So I would just sum that up with, um, I agree with you. And always be looking to ask better questions and not to be rude, but it's the, it's the no, but why, yeah. why, you know, why not? Yeah. Why, why can't we, why won't that work? Um, so yeah, I love that's... that dude. I mean, even if, even if it doesn't work, like can't do it, the no, but why lets you learn a little bit more about that person's trade. And that gives you more power and equips you to make better decisions. I've asked no, but why? And the answer really was no. But I learned something about construction that on the next deal I looked at, I realized, oh, we could do it differently based on what I learned from over here, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, I've had to learn to see things from a contractor's point of view. Like uh, uh, one that comes up all the time, like a really simple example would be uh, weight load bearing walls because I'm always changing floor plans, right? So you start talking to these guys and you're like, well, why? And they say, well, they give you the reason why it couldn't work. If only it was like this, then we could have made it work. Well, now I kind of understand just the architecture of how this works. So when I see the next deal, I'm like, oh, he told me that that could work if it was different. This one does look like that. So we could do it this way, right? Oh, I suppose they could. And it goes from a $15,000 problem to a $900 problem with a different mm -hmm. way of doing it, right? Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's gold. That's gold there. So the, this is a, a relationship business. And what I've learned, when you ask the no, but why, if it's to a builder, if it's to a planner, if it's to a decision maker of some sort in your authority, um, 
you you take the guard of professionalism down and you talk to them like a person. You talk to them like a peer or like a player on the same team. Well, why not? That's different than professional lingo. And, you know, I've, I've gotten some of the best lessons I've ever learned from people that didn't even know they were teaching me just because they let their professional guard down and their title down yeah. and talk to me like a person. So that's that's what really I think that's where relationships are really formed is when you can get down to like the lower level and just talk shop with somebody. And, and it's it's not brought up by asking a sophisticated question. It's like, well, how the hell would you do that? You know, and I think so you brought up another thing that I've been talking about a lot. Calvin and Jesse, thanks for your patience. We got people waiting in the studio. They're not getting a chance to come in. And it just has to do with the questions that you ask are so much more important than you think. Like the type of question you ask is a reflection of where your heart's at. So I will frequently say to somebody who doesn't want to do something that I want them to do, can you do this? And if their heart is in a place where they don't want to do it, their answer will be no. And this is why you can't. It is very easy for them to come up with an answer that's no. Then I'll go to Kyle. I'll say, hey, Kyle, can we do this? And he'll say, yeah, but we'd have to do it like this. <laughs> and then Kyle solves the problem in nine minutes that somebody else for six months was saying, no, we can't do it, right? Your heart is such an important factor in what your brain is going to come up with. If you don't want to find the solution, you won't. So if you're asking questions and you're looking for a reason to not go forward because you're afraid or you don't want to do the deal you're having second thoughts and you're going to ask questions that will get you the answer of no. If you're looking for a way to move forward, overcome obstacles, if that requires something of yourself that has to change, get out of your comfort zone, you literally ask different questions. You just don't ask, can it be done? You ask, how could it be done? And if someone tells you no, you say, all right, well, tell me more about this job so I can understand it because you want to understand more about what an appraiser is doing or a contractor's doing, or a real estate agent's doing. The more you get in their head, the more you see how their world works, the more equipped you are to be a better partner with that person. When you're just like, you serve me, you're a contractor, give me a quote, give me a bid, don't ask me to pay you. I just want the cheapest bid I can possibly get. They pick up on that. The type of questions you're going to ask are going to reveal that's what you're looking to do. They know to stay as far away from you as possible. They're not going to think on their own how to save you money because you're giving them the vibe that you're just trying to use them, right? Like, I guess I'm going on a tangent here, but I've just in life I've been noticing because Kyle and I spend a lot of time interviewing people now. You can spot people's motives much easier than they think you can. All right. Like you're better off to live life from a perspective of I assume that everyone knows my motives. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not trying to get over on you. You're way better off to just come clean with what your motives are because they can tell. Right. When you think that you're outsmarting somebody else, you're just encouraging them to outsmart you. So I know that was a bit philosophical. I want to add a couple of things to that, David. <clears throat> I think it's really interesting that you bring up the, the, the mind and the heart because uh, I was actually talking to somebody about that today on the phone. It is so important for us to make sure when we're negotiating, when we're talking to somebody, when we're learning, when we're working with a contractor, whatever, when we're interviewing, hiring people, that we connect from the heart first. And a lot of times we want to just connect from the mind. And you and I have talked about this, David, about how our emotions are what drive us to make decisions. It's what drives other people to make decisions. And if you're connecting with people brain to brain, right, and you're trying to connect with them from a logic standpoint, you're not connecting with them from the heart. And as a result, you're not really going to get anywhere. You're not going to actually see the posture of their heart. And then when you say that, the first, one of the first people that actually comes to my mind is Derek right here with us tonight. Like, there's no secret, Derek, that you, you have sort of worked your way into the David Green team realm and our world because you've led with the heart not with your mind right like you're you're a brilliant dude you bring a lot to the table but for those of you that don't know Derek he has always been willing to lead with his heart he's always been willing to bring value first and get to know exactly what is David looking for what is Kyle looking for what is the David Green team looking for in all of this right and so uh, Derek's actually driven from southern Oregon all the way down to northern California like six seven hours to come and help and serve at our meetup and getting out there and constructing different things and helping us set up signs and stuff like that. He's always led with his heart first, trying to serve first. And as a result, his world has gotten a lot bigger, not just with the David Green team, but as he continues to expand what he does and helping other people. So there's no, um, uh, there, it's a little bit of a tangent there, but there's no uh, coincidence that those two things um, are obviously very connected. 
Awesome. Derek, did you want All right. to get your Confucius on and make comment, or should we get back to real estate? <laughs> no, let's see if we can help Calvin. <clears throat> All right, man, Calvin. Our, our so, next. Yeah, so Calvin's uh, question is for you, Derek, specifically. He wants to know about your parking situation for ADU tenants. Um, where he lives in Tampa, they target homes with alley access for ADU builds or detached garage conversions. And then he also has sort of a, a second follow-up question about rental comps as well. Calvin, welcome to the stream. What's up, fellas? Thanks for putting this on. This is the uh, the Friday night jam for me. <laughs> um, yeah, real quick, Derek. For me in Tampa, uh, I think that a lot of properties, like the average home is 1,000 square foot on a 7,000 square foot lot, right? So the backyard is just ginormous, and there's so much ADU activity that could potentially take place. But it's like, all right, I'd rather focus on something that has alley access so that way the tenant has their own private access rather than like taking up the parking that's in the current driveway for the primary. Um, so, and I, and there's some city restrictions that would say like, you know, you got to add an additional two parking spaces per ADU that's built uh, just for the, the size that makes sense as, in, as far as the permitting works. Um, and then my other follow-up question was, as far as rental comps go, are you comparing these to duplexes or one one apartments or just a blend of both? I've been kind of taking um, rental meter and the MLS and other resources for my comps, but I'd like to hear what, what you're doing. Yeah, great, Calvin. I, I want to just start with saying you're going to be really successful with this strategy because um, back to what we were just talking about, the head and the heart and what you're leading with, like your first concern is for your tenant. It's not for you. It's not like I can meet the parking standard. I'm just going to build, build, build. You're like, I want my tenant to have a nice off street spot to park. So that's really cool. I, I just noticed that. I would say to target areas that have good parking, if it's alley access or not, there's an access parking and circulation standard in every municipal code. So I would call your local planning office. I like to call email and go in and say, hey, can I look at the planning and parking standards for these zones that I'm shopping in or this zone where my house is at? And you need to understand where the parking is because just because it has alley access and there's 6,000 square feet that you could put lots of cars in doesn't mean you could actually legally per zoning law park a car there. So first of all, it'd take you less than an hour to probably educate yourself on the parking standard in the area that you own in or you're shopping in. And then you want to target that. So alley access is awesome if there's um, if there's room to park. Some codes in some cities, they only allow you to park off street in the alley. So if you have a primary house and there's two spots, um, are you concerned about alley access parking? Yes, you are. Check with your city zoning official to see if you can put parking there. Is this for a property that you already own or one that you're looking to buy? I'm a real estate agent here and work with a lot of millennials okay. that are looking to take advantage of the okay. market. Okay, cool. Yeah, I would just say you'd be at, at leaps and bounds ahead of other realtors if you knew some of these codes that pertain to ADUs, such as parking. And I will also say that um, legislatively, uh, as a body, we're moving away from parking nationwide. I mean, there's uh, Oregon and California have eliminated the, the requirement for off-street parking for ADUs. Um, they're still not dropping parking requirement boxing gloves for short-term rentals yet. I don't know why they're so two-sided, but um, I would just, uh, even if you expect to see legislative changes in parking, it's really important that you do provide your tenant good parking. So when I'm, when I'm looking for properties to purchase, I'm looking for location. I'm looking for flat. I'm looking for newer 1970s. I'm looking for plenty of parking. So I didn't mention that earlier in my take, and I'm glad that you asked that question because parking can be a total deal killer, not just by not being able to meet the standard, but not having anywhere for your tenants and of your primary and your ADU to park. So good thought. I mean, to be a realtor asking those questions is, I mean, you're probably a top performer, I would guess. And then the second question you're talking about asking uh, is rent comps. And I don't know the Tampa market very well from what I know of it. There's a lot of like bungalow, smaller houses in the urban sprawl. And then there's a lot of density, tighter and taller, um, closer to the Metro. If that's correct, I would say it's going to be hard to comp your ADU. I would comp it closer to small bungalow houses. Um, the, the benefit of an ADU, especially if it's, is if it is detached is you have all these multifamily 
tenants, you know, your clientele is usually a renter that comes from multifamily and they're coming out a little farther and they're going to live in a house with no shared walls. They're not going to have a neighbor above, below, beside, uh, or all of the above. And so there's a premium for that. And what I do is I go to um, my local sources, which here everybody uses Zillow, which links over to hot pads, apartments.com. And then I go to Craigslist and I set my search criteria to number of bedrooms and number of bathrooms. And then I go through and I pull every single one of those within a range. We're in a smaller area. So I go with a larger bubble for you. It might be within five miles look at every single one, one, if that's what you're going to build and then start eliminating apartments. And you're going to boil it down to a nice little section of small bungalow houses that are 600 square feet and one bedroom, one bath. Yours is going to be brand new. So that's going to give you a 10 to 15% advantage over them, in my opinion. Uh, And that's kind of where I start. So we're looking again to build a super high demand, low supply product, have better service and be right under the top of market rate. So I like to throw out the high couple that aren't going to rent just because it's on Zillow for X amount a month does not mean it has a tenant. In fact, it means it doesn't have a tenant yet. So I look at these rental, the dog scared me, sorry. I look at these rental numbers every night. And so you can see what sets, what's too expensive and you can see what rents. And that's where you kind of find that, that line. Hey, come here dog. All right, sweet. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. It's great advice, Derek. See ya. Great question, too. We'll let Derek get those dogs. Sorry, guys. I, um, yeah. um, somebody just came home and the dogs. Thing. We're good. Oh, we're good. Okay. <laughs> um, we do have another person that has a, a question here, Jesse, who David and I know quite well. Um, I'm going to add her to the stream right now. Jesse has a question particularly regarding um, regarding permitting. But before we do that, Jesse, can you hear us okay? It looks like you're kind of glitching a little bit. Oh, we just lost her. Wasn't there a movie where the character glitched? Like a racing movie? I think wow. her name was Penelope. Uh, Who here in the Wreck-It comments Ralph. knows that? Is that Wreck-It, Wreck-It Ralph? Ralph. Yeah. yeah, maybe Wreck-It Ralph yeah. too. I think you're right. Yeah. So Jesse's getting her uh, Penelope on here. Yeah, she's so on property. Oh, that's a great question. Wonderful. I was hoping that one would come up. Hopefully, she can come on and yeah. ask it. Um, if she does, we will get her. But uh, I did want to share that the place we do know her from uh, is actually from the Scottsdale retreat that David hosted here. Uh, about a month ago, we had a great time and got to know Jesse along with uh, a bunch of other investors really, really well. And he's somebody who is very dialed in with her goals and her aspirations. So uh, for those of you that don't know, but David actually puts on uh, retreats every few months. You can find out more information at davidgreen24.com slash retreat. Probably one of the best experiences I've had. Um, I know, Derek, you and I were talking before we went live today. Um, and you were you were wanting to come and to to not to to that one you weren't able to make it, but to a, another one in the future. And it's just a great opportunity, number one, to to get so much information and learn um, a fire hose of information from David. But then, in addition to that, it's just a great opportunity to really get focused on yourself, your goals. What does your portfolio look like now? What do you want it to look like in the future? Where do you want to go? How can you build that financial fortress? And how can you get around other people who are are doing the same thing and learn from them. And we just, we had a great, great group of investors and just in the overall individuals that came and joined us. It was a, an awesome time. Hey, I really just wanted to say, I, I was going to go just to challenge David to a long drive competition. I mean, I saw those pictures and I was so jealous. I was like, oh, no. No God. one was jealous of that, man. Don't I haven't, they, I haven't swung a golf, golf club since I was 10 years old. And Kyle got either my first or second swing, which, I will admit, I like Kyle had to tell me how you hold the golf club. Like, I didn't know where to put your hands. I didn't know you were supposed to bend over. I was just glad I didn't miss the entire ball. Like, that's kind of what I was expecting. So, the fact it went forward and didn't bounce on the ground was, I was very, and it was straight. Yeah, surprisingly so, with like an iron. So, uh, you will beat me at any form of long drive, but 
I was telling Kyle that actually was not that embarrassing and pretty fun. So we should go do Top Golf again. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know I, if I'm. Everybody was so smiley. You could just tell how much fun it didn't. The golf didn't matter. It was like, look how much fun they're having as a group. That was cool. Oh, that is very true. And I will say when Jesse comes back in, we'll hear about whatever her question is. But there's been several people from the retreat that went out and put a property under contract like within 30 mm -hmm. days of doing it. So uh, there's something about when you get in that environment and you're learning stuff, you're not just learning, you're getting like a new perspective or a level of confidence you didn't have that helps you get over the hump, that helps you go out there and, and take action. So uh, there were several people that left there and then said, hey, I just put this property under contract and like we're moving forward. And they were people I connected them with realtors. So if you're having a hard time getting over the hump, I think it's a really, really powerful thing to do. And then if you like to go deep. So like we went really deep on philosophy, strategy, techniques, like some of the stuff we're covering here today is just like a, a concept to think about, like maybe buying in the right location and adjusting the property versus buying a property that's right out the box, good to go in the wrong location. And then getting into examples of this is what it looks like when you do it the right way. This is what it would be look like if you did it the wrong way. So I had a good time. Uh, Kyle had to handle all the logistics of it. I don't know if it was as much fun for him, but he's saying he had a good time. I did. Yeah, I had a great time. I uh, had great support by Katie, our director of operations. So that freed me up to be able to connect with a lot of the investors and uh, overall just had a really, really good experience. So welcome, Jesse. I think you're here. And you got internet connection. You're back. Yes. Oh my God. The worst. Uh, All right. I'm glad. Hey, while, while, while we're on the topic of the retreat, do you mind just sharing real quick kind of your experience and, and how it was for you? For the retreat? Yeah. Oh man, it was awesome. I highly recommend. I hope you guys do more. I'll definitely plan on coming back. I mean, the it was such an intense, um, concentrated delivery of high value information. It was well worth everything so um yeah it was amazing did you get out there and swing a golf club i did nice job Very it wasn't cool. great to look at but i did <laughs> i love it yeah and we'll uh just real quick before we get well to let me ask this jesse looking. what was your favorite part of the retreat uh you know what sitting <laughs> on that nice comfy couch in the uh the place listening to you dish out all the pearls and secrets and then writing feverishly in my book you are a feverish note taker and i will say that was very encouraging like right wrong or indifferent when you're speaking and people start taking notes you're like oh i guess i'm saying good things i should keep talking Definitely. uh when you don't get any feedback like when i did the ted talk it was very difficult um when i've gone on the news so like if i do like a cnn interview or something <laughs> they black out the screen to force you to look at your camera. Cause like right now I'm looking at your guys' faces and my eyes look like I'm looking below the camera, right? If I look up at the camera, I don't see how you're responding to what I'm saying. Right. And it's actually nerve wracking trying to talk to someone and not know how they're responding. You don't realize how much nonverbal cues you look for when right. determining what should I say? Did I say something good? Should I keep going? Is it time to shut up? Should I change topics? Right? So when you do the news, it's terrible because you don't know when they want to talk. You don't see them like raise their finger or open their mouth like, oh, they wanted to say something I should stop. You just, and you don't know when you should stop your point. Right. So you kind of just like talk and talk and talk and talk until you get some feeling like, I guess that's probably enough. And then you abruptly stop and hope that they can think of a question that they have to ask because it's live. I also assume the news was like not live. I, you would think that they'd be have like a five or 10 second delay or something in the news, but no, it's like you know. pretty much as it goes. So mm -hmm. uh, long story short, it's difficult to, to have a to give a speech when it's not a back and forth so mm -hmm. i appreciated your support with that jesse and you also i would say you were the most tireless person at that entire thing i yep. never saw fatigue there was never a point where you didn't have a question you are the energizer bunny like <laughs> i'm not surprised that you are successful in everything else you do because you just never quit mm. never a point when she didn't have a smile on her face that's yeah. true too there it was such a good experience so yeah mm. definitely so Jesse, uh, why don't you jump in and uh, yeah, thank you for putting that back up on the screen there. I, I had to point out Jimmy's uh, quote about uh, David said David has a happy Gilmore swing still better than his. I don't know. Jimmy was a pretty decent golfer too. Yeah, Jimmy's being uh, self-deprecating. He golfs every once in a while. Hey Jimmy. Yeah. 
<laughs> I could only swing a handful of times because it didn't look good. So I don't want everyone there losing respect for me. Yeah, you did but... like one really good one and you're like, I'm out. I'm that good. was it. I think I probably took four swings total. The last one was like with a driver and it was good. And I definitely yeah. just like uh, Barry Sanders my way right out of that. Leave it on top. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. So let's throw it over to you, Jesse. Thanks for your feedback, though, on the retreat. Um, so tell us and tell Derek, what, what's your question you have? Yeah. So my question and the segue for the retreat is that it totally fired me up. And I went back on the market and I put some offers in and I negotiated my way using so many of those things that you said, David, the seller, the 3% seller credit, the out, outside escrow account for repairs. Um, this is a duplex. And the, it's a two separate properties. The front house has an unfinished, I mean, it's a furnished, finished, unpermitted unit that they're not advertising as part of the, you know, they're not saying it's a triplex. They're not saying it's an ADU. They're just like kind of keep it on the, the mm -hmm. DL. Um, and there's a detached two car garage. So my vision for it was like, okay, get the two, two car garage converted into an ADU and then hopefully get the, basement permitted so everything's above the 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 water level board. my concern is um is it wise to buy one buy a, a unit that has a, a finished but unpermitted sp space considering you don't really know what you're going to find when you're trying to permit it maybe there's a bunch of stuff that's wrong with it the insulation's wrong whatever's wrong and then you the city's on you at this point so you got to fix whatever you find so there's these potential unknown costs that you're walking into um, or on the other hand, if you leave it unpermitted and you, you actually rent it out, what kind of risks are you taking on insurance wise, liability wise, <coughs> it out to tenants and it's unpermitted, um, aside from obviously the city catching you and slapping a code violation on you. So I guess what would be your recommendation, whether A, it's wise to even get into this and B, do you permit it or do you kind of still fly under the radar and what are the risks there? Well, before I let Derek jump into it, I want to ask a couple of questions. When you say, do you permit it? Yeah. Are you saying, do you have the city come in and make you put everything up to code? Or are you saying that there may be a structure on the property that it's not zoned for? Oh, no, the zoning is fine. The zoning okay. is fine. Uh, it's purely, you know, getting the city in there and making it all. So like basically, hey guys, I have more more property on this land than what you thought i need you to raise the tax bill and i want the city to know that this exists is that what you're what you're saying well i just don't want to get busted for it and then have issues um and i and again, i don't know if there's a liability part of it like let's say there's a tenant in there and they burned down the house because they were used the stove and technically the, this wasn't a permitted area like will you cover me like i just this is kind of i don't know this area very well if, i see and I don't want to get myself in trouble. So Derek's going to have some good stuff, but I will say before I turn it over to him, and Derek, you'd probably agree, none of us have ever walked through a home that was completely permitted, ever. Mm -hmm. Not I my, myself. Like Even if you get a brand new construction just built, the right person can find something that was outside of code in some way. Mm -hmm. Technically, you're supposed to get permits for everything, including putting in recessed lighting, changing the floor from carpet to LVP, changing a shower head. It's supposed to have a permit for all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So everything's not permitted. The question then becomes like what is safe and what is unsafe? That's mm -hmm. usually what we're looking at. Like, did they build this thing dangerously or at the time it was built? Maybe it was up to code. The work was done well. Mm -hmm. Codes have changed since then. Right. So just before we dive into the specifics of it, I, it's not a black and white thing. Like, is it permitted or is it not permitted? There's a like spectrum of how this goes. But uh, I'll I'll probably wait at the end after Derek takes a shot at it. Cool. I'll go for that one. Um, that's that's like three really awesome questions in one. So first and foremost, have you bought the property yet? I'm under contract. OK, so this is the time to like show your soft investor underbelly because if you get this the city is going to know you have something that's unpermitted uh what i would do what i always do is look at the tax roll and see if if you're paying taxes on it if you're paying taxes on it it's permitted if you're not he muted himself to tell someone yeah. to quiet his dogs yeah yeah thanks Derek. yeah sorry that's a, there's a couple of dog barks i'm gonna let them out here one sec can i have uh 
can you guys talk about yeah, the retreat for about 30 seconds? That's a good idea. <laughs> All right, Jesse, now you're on the spot again before we get to your ADU yeah, question. But, but great. What was your second favorite part of the retreat? Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> I was going to slam you guys another question. See, as you know. um, my second favorite part, just hanging out with everybody, getting, getting to know you guys in person, Christian, um, your whole team and getting to know all the other um, participants. You know, it's really cool to see where people are at, what they're doing, what their strategies are. It's like super cool to like share stories and really kind of fire each other up too. Awesome. Like we're a little right. mini family now. Like we saw yeah. each other at BTCon. It was like, oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was two others that were there. And I was like, Ginger, what's up? And like everybody, like, it was cool. All right, Derek. Yeah, yeah, I'm back. So the the coolest part about an unpermitted ADU in an area that will permit it is you have a huge bargaining chip, potentially. A lot of times realtors will advertise, market, and price a house that has an unpermitted finished basement as like house with mother-in-law suite downstairs. If that's the case, you can be a professional. You can be a, uh, you know, know your zoning codes and you can go back and say, Hey, this is actually unpermitted based on this, this, and this, it's going to cost $20,000 in system development fees. We're going to have to pull new wiring because there's no GFIs. And if somebody dropped a toaster in the sink, it would kill them. And it's going to cost us about $40,000 to do that. I walk through it with my contractor would you take 30 grand off the price? Um, the, uh, an amazing tip that I use all the time and I share with people is if you have time and you can pull it off quick enough would be to schedule a special inspection with your local building official. And it's usually two to $400. Um, a lot of times you can get it done within 14 days. Some cities mandate that you have to be able to get that inspection for safety reasons done within 14 days. So call and ask, can I get a special inspection on a property I'm under contract with? It has an unpermitted basement. The seller has disclosed it. I would like to get it up to code to provide needed infill housing. Will you come out and tell me what it needs? And then you would meet there at the property or have your agent or your team meet there with your contractor and the building official and go through that unpermitted space to figure out exactly what it would need to be brought up to code. Um, what I see a lot of times is it's very simple. Most contractors can walk through an unpermitted space and say, hey, this was built by a professional to code. They just didn't pull permits because they didn't want to go on the tax roll. That's way different than somebody buying a house, closing on it, going to permit their basement ADU and 60% of the space in the basement is under seven feet and there's no egress window and it'll basically never be living space unless you chip out the floor. So there's there's two, like David said, it's, it's not black and white. There's very different scenarios. The flow chart I use is, um, is it a liability with the city? That's not a big deal. They're gonna red flag you, uh, stop and assist. They're gonna say, you can't rent that. They'll send you a nasty letter. That's nothing. Um, below that would be somebody gets hurt. Is your insurance going to cover it? Well, probably not. Insurance agencies have fountains out in front of their buildings because there's a lot of fine print that benefit them, not you. And then below that is, is somebody going to get injured or killed and could I live with myself? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the, here's the flow chart of what could possibly go wrong. But if you're looking at a property that has a finished basement that's not <coughs> permitted in an area that is pro infill housing and and you know the city says oh yeah that's zoned you could have a jadu downstairs or you could have an over under duplex and you have a contractor walk through it and say this is pretty good work we're going to have to change a few things any general decent general contractor in that area is going to have a relationship with the building department and know what you have to do to get that up to code so you need to get professional eyes on it to make mm -hmm. sure you're not missing anything huge like too low of a ceiling yeah. no room to put an egress window in you can't put um, a window well because there's a gas meter there or something like that that would be a total deal breaker and then as far as the detached garage adu option um you know those those are a slam dunk in a lot of cases if uh, you're willing to give up your garage but it sounds like you're a pro i mean obviously what they said you're you're an overachiever but knowing that it already allows the zoning for what you want to convert is is kind of the starting point yeah, I got I got an architect in there actually yesterday or the day before to give me an idea if it was if there was going to be any critical reasons why it wouldn't be permitted. Um, my question to you though is if you get the city, uh, that's, that's a great um, suggestion. I didn't know about that uh, to get someone from the city come. Um, is it now on the city's city's radar though in terms of 
putting a code violation to the sellers if I end up not buying the place or or me, you know, does it? Yeah. Yes. Off? Yes. Yes. Good question. And yes, the, the answer is yes. I mean, you, you're showing your soft investor underbelly to you and to the seller, but you're, uh, I'm assuming, um, I guess I'm assuming, where's the property at? San Diego. Okay. And I'm sure it's probably close to a million dollars or more. I mean, you need to have that question answered. Like you're yeah. not worried about upsetting the seller's feelings. In fact, your agent should already have done this with their agent. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe they did. If, if you know, David, he probably hooked you up with a rock star agent and they're already working this, you know, yeah. uh, on the sidelines. Yeah. Yeah. And my last question is this place, both units may have foundation problems. We found out on inspection this week. Mm -hmm. I guess this is for all of you guys. Like, when do you pull the cords? You know, of course, I'm like super happy and proud. I got this thing under contract and made all these negotiations. I'm like got all these major plans on turning this into like four units. But when do you pull the, the plug saying, you know what, there's significant structural problems here and it's going to cost a lot of money, which again, I'm getting people to come and tell me how much estimates. Well, OK, I can jump in with that. You're doing the right thing. You might just not know you're doing the right thing. So the first step every time this comes up, turn the problem into a dollar sign. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the problem? I don't care. Is it lead based paint? Is it termites? Is it foundation? Like there isn't a problem that can't be fixed with some amount of money. Okay? Right. So you get an idea of what it would cost. Then because you're still in escrow, you take that problem to the sellers and you see if you can make it their problem, not yours. Mm -hmm. Your property has this foundation issues. I'll also say in my experience, I'm sure Derek and Kyle would agree. What you're quoted to fix it is almost always more than what you would pay to have it fixed. Mm. And that, that helps for you with negotiation. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. You'll get a, a pest inspector come in and say, this is a $9,000 problem. And then you'll find like Joey Handyman who says, I can do that for 1400 bucks. This happens a lot. So mm -hmm. you get this foundation thing. You get a report. They're going to give you every single thing they possibly could do to fix that. It's going to be their highest estimate they come up with. It's $30,000. You go to the seller and you may say, hey, we're going to have to negotiate this $30,000 repair. Then you either get a different foundation person in there or you go back to that company and say, you're not getting $30,000. I'll give you the job for $20,000 or twenty one mm -hmm. or something and skip this part, but just do these parts. Oh yeah, we could do that for you. Like half of that was superfluous anyways. It didn't really need to be done, but we wanted it on the report just in case. Mm -hmm. So once you turn it into a dollar sign, then you go and you make it the seller's problem. That does not mean it has to be 30 for 30. That's funny because that's an ESPN phrase. It doesn't mean it has to be $30,000 <laughs> for a $30,000 credit, right? There, there there, can be some form of wiggle room, especially because um, it's not nothing in San Diego is brand new. All those houses are old. Every house out there has some form of a foundation. 1920s. Um, okay, so it's older, right? And a lot of the houses around it are going to be older also. Mm -hmm. But the, the F word foundation does not need to freak you out. Mm. Okay. And it, I was raised in real estate. Just the way I was trained was the minute you hear foundation, you run the other way, right? Like it just, it can't be cured. No. Right. I've seen foundation problems solved for like 3,500 bucks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like it depends if they have to jack up the whole house, if they have to rebuild the system, like different houses, this one's on a basement foundation. So I don't know if that makes it more complicated or less complicated mm -hmm. versus if it's on like a pier and beam, which is what most California properties tend to be built on. But mm -hmm. uh, before we know, you got to turn it into a dollar sign. You got to yeah. figure out from them what it would cost. And yeah. then when the sellers get that information, technically they are now required to disclose that to any future buyer. Mm. So the market's turning around on those sellers. It doesn't right. look like it's going to get any better. I mean, San Diego's not like dying. It's still mm -hmm. the best weather in the world an amazing mm -hmm. place to be, but it doesn't look like it's going to get better for them. Mm -hmm. They're already somewhat pot committed, taking their house off the market, putting it under contract with you. Now they're being presented with this fact that they have this foundation problem that legally they're supposed to disclose to anyone else that buys the house. There's a lot of leverage sitting on your side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would do everything that we're saying here. And then I would not feel committed to making a decision in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You go to them and you're like, I'm, I'm making up this $30,000 number. I have no idea what it would be. But let's say you say there's a $30,000 problem. I'm willing to accept a $20,000 credit. Or you guys go spend $30,000 and fix it and I'll buy the house as it is. Let them talk it over. Don't back out of the deal. Just extend your inspection contingency. Don't waive it and just sit. Just play chicken. Mm -hmm. All right. At a certain point, they're either going to they're gonna take it off the out of contract with you and try to sell it to someone else. Or 
they're going to say, fine, we'll give you this, or, well, we won't give you the full 30, but we'll give you 18, or your, your realtor is going to be able to negotiate from that point. Mm -hmm. But you're in a position where the longer this drags out, the better it is for you. Mm -hmm. This is siege warfare, and you're outside the castle. They're sitting in the castle. Mm -hmm. They got to come out and fight you, or they got to wave the red, the white flag. But the longer this goes, the better this is for you, right? If you were the seller, I'd be giving you very different information about mm -hmm. how to negotiate. We'd be like, we got to get to a solution quick here because time's against you. So hearing that, what questions are still remaining? Um. No, no questions. Thanks for kind of reinforcing kind of what I was thinking. We're getting, we're trying to ch change the problem um, in the next few days um, to really kind of get down to it. And my idea was going back to the negotiating table. Um, you know. Well, we learned, we talked about that, right? This would just be yeah. what I call post escrow negotiations, pre escrow mm -hmm. negotiate. You already did well. You got mm -hmm. a seller credit from them. You were able to get some money set aside. Like you did everything right. This is mm -hmm. part of the process. Like, hey, guys, didn't disclose that your foundation wasn't good. Mm -hmm. Right. But I do, I would not want you thinking, oh, there's a problem. Throw it back. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's very rare to find property in San Diego that could be a house hack at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, that is in my top five of questions I get for all of real estate. Okay. I'm talking, should I buy it in my own name or should I open an LLC? Like right. including those questions, mm -hmm. how do I house hack in San Diego is in the top five of everything. <laughs> this is how hard that is to do because everyone wants to live there. It is incredibly expensive real estate yeah. and there's not a lot of actual properties that would work. Right. Okay. So if you've got one that has a basement and it's got a house and it has an ADU and on top of that, was it you're saying also it has a garage that could be converted, you're saying? Uh, yeah, so it'd be it'd be a total of four. And actually, this thing is has like a piece of land with it, or part of the lot is empty, and you could potentially put more units. But that would be like completely new construction. Well, I would I would ask the city when you go there, what are the odds that we could reparcel this? Like, would you guys approve if I if you did that? And now you have another lot that could be reparceled. Neither you build a property on it or you sell the lot or something, right? Um, but there's a lot of upside to this. So if the foundation is horrible. Mm -hmm. Like it's going to be $400,000 to fix this type of a thing. That's, that's a certain situation. Okay. But I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater because these are very rare to find. And it might be a long time before you find any other property yeah. that has the potential to house hack, especially in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Cool. But make it the seller's problem. So we'll sum that up, yeah. turn it into a dollar, make it the seller's problem, play, uh, get in a standoff, let them, let them cave before you. Sounds good. All right, Jesse. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Hey, Jesse. Thanks, Jesse. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, I would just add on just real quickly to what David uh, mentioned is is he he nailed all the real estate and the financial and turned into a math problem and then um, do a standoff. But remember too that you're gonna have to associate some of your time with that decision. So um, is a bad foundation gonna scare you off? No, especially if it can be fixed. But just understand that if it takes six months to get this property up to four units and $200,000 or $500,000, are you better off spending two or $500,000 more if anything is available and having it available, you know, um, to potentially cash flow day one. Right. Um, but in that market, it sounds like, I mean, just hearing about the property, uh, I wouldn't give up on that unless you had a professional that has relationships with the city in that area, tell you to run. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks so much, Derek. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, David. Thank you. Have a good Thanks, night. Friday. See ya. Bye. Bye. All right. That being said, I think we've got time for one final question here. Uh, we've got Alex who we're going to bring in. And <clears throat> she had a question for you. And maybe, Derek, you can help out with this. She's asking, what if the ADU is already started? and you need to fix it or fix the plans or sort of pick it up midway, how would you go about finding out what needs to be fixed? So Alex, welcome to the, the stream here. Thanks for joining us. Did I, uh, did I say your question correctly there? Yeah, hi Kyle, hi Derek, hi David. Um, yeah, basically, so there's this property that my realtor had presented to me and it's a pretty good value. I live in LA and so it's a pretty good price. Um, it's a duplex and there was an ADU that was built. It was a garage conversion. And according to the um, the seller, they were saying that it was turned into an ADU. And then during COVID, 
um, they had someone living in there and they tried to apply for the COVID relief and the city realized that it wasn't permitted. So then they said, you have to get the renter out until it's actually permitted. According to the seller, all that needs to be done is that the roof needs to be raised. Um, but how do I go about finding out that that is actually all that needs to be done? That's another great question, similar um, to the last one. Thanks, Alex, for asking that and, ha and coming on. And you're obviously doing good if you're going to be buying a house in L.A. Good for you. Cheer, cheer. So I would say the same thing. Get the decision maker on site, preferably before you own it to get mm -hmm. that answer. I, I would say nine out of 10 times, if the seller said it needs this, they're trying to sell you their house. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I don't want to ever hear the seller said this. I want to hear the decision maker who signs the certificate of, of occupancy says you need to do this. Okay. Um, you know, if it was already flagged as a legal existing use, you obviously are going to have to go through the whole process. Um, just hearing that the roof needs to be raised to me, brings up some red flags. I mean, if it's too, too low to be qualified as habitable living space, what else isn't built to living standards? I mean, how thin are the walls? Can you meet insulation requirements? Are there um, going to be, can you meet safety issues with ingress, egress? I would say it probably needs um, more work than the seller says. Mm -hmm. I would ask the seller, do they have any plans? Do they have any documentation of starting the process with the authority having jurisdiction? Um, and if you can, if you have enough time to get a special inspection from the, the city building official before you buy it, that would that would take away all the guesswork. They would give you a written report for a few hundred dollars of what you need to do to comply. Okay. And then my other question would be, um, I would be buying this home FHA. So one of the tenants that's currently in there, I would have to take one over and I would be able to remodel the, that one. But there's the other unit in the ADU that I would have to fix up. So in terms of financing, do you have any like recommendations in Southern California that you would recommend to be able to fix all that up? I would talk to the one brokerage um, okay. and set up an appointment with one of uh, David's teammates probably is it would be the I'll let David take that one. Well, are you looking at like a loan for construction you're saying or are you talking yeah, about a because loan to I buy have, the like, house? So the house is about like 500,000 is what they're willing to give it to me for. But that's what I'm trying to make sure that everything else needs to be um, that I'm able to fix everything else that they're saying. And I have about 100,000. If I'm buying FHA, I only have to put like three and a half down. But with the ADU and everything to be fixed up to be able to raise to market rent, it's going to add up very quickly. So I'm just looking at other financing options also. Are you working with one of our agents there? No. Okay. And are you working with our loan team? No. So then you're going to have to go to your lender to ask that question, unfortunately, because I'm a broker. So if people don't work with my agents or our loan team, then I can't legally comment on like another person's deal. So okay. hopefully in the future, you'll work with David Green team or the one brokerage and I'll be able to give some advice on what to do. But as a licensed broker, I can't comment on another broker's work. But there okay. is a way to finance that. Yes. Okay. And hey, Alex, what, what do you do for a living? If you don't mind me asking. I'm a speech pathologist. Awesome. And do you have anybody in your really close circle that's a contractor? Um, yeah, I know a couple people that are contractors. Okay. Because uh, one thing that's really important um, to ask folks is like, what's the greatest and best use of your time? If it's trying to remodel two houses and put a roof on an ADU while you make good money at the hospital, it, it may be you may be better off to take that really good loan product. The FHA loan right now is the best loan out there. The first time buyer FHA loan is like the best. It's like the only affordable thing in the lending world right now. So I would go look for something that's already maybe not turnkey, but something where you can go to your job and make your living and not have to worry about tearing a roof on and raising it and putting it back on. Um, Especially so in a market like this, like that's just my advice. You, you've got in, in most cases, you've got the leverage as a buyer right now. Mm -hmm. Um, this is the best time to buy in my entire career outside of 2009, 10 and 11, like buyers have more leverage than they ever have. So mm -hmm. like our agents are, are gouging sellers right now for concessions, credits. Um, I mean, certain, or certain markets like San Diego, you may not be able to do that, but like, yeah, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, if it's a, a house that's not fixed up, that needs something like it's ugly or it doesn't have a ton of desire you could go in there and just be like, yeah, uh, the 500 is now 470 and we need an answer in the next 24 hours or I'm out of here. Like your agent should be 
really poking at that other seller's listing agent and figuring out are they really willing to put their house back on the market when rates are going up another you know 75 basis points next week or are they going to just say screw it we'll take this deal and your lender should be talking to them like if if it was if you're doing your deal with us i would tell the lender call the listing agent and say rates are going up in this point and we need to get the deal closed before that happens and then have your agent call them and say you need to drop the price to this much before rates go up and put all that pressure on the seller okay. and they would probably be caving. So, and if they don't find another house, there's tons of them. This is the best yeah. time ever to be a buyer. That's what I was getting at. Like, this is not the time to move forward with a house that you don't love. This is the time when you get to be picky finally. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Find, find something that's going to work that you can control the variables. If you can find a duplex, you know what the payments are going to be. You know, without a doubt what the rents are going to be. There's no unknown variables. And me, even with 30 years as a builder, like I'm still looking to avoid uncontrollable barriers that come up and buy something that's more complete. So just control the variables by buying something closer to rent ready. Okay. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Alex. I, have we had, had her on before? I feel like we talked with her. She was walking around outside like a month or two ago. Might've been the same Alex. Yeah. She was all she's been on. If you guys have let her on, Go if ahead, you've Derek. let her on live twice and she doesn't have an agent or a lender with the David Green team, well, you're going to have to send her a Christmas card. If it's the same person I'm thinking of, <laughs> we connected her to one of our agents on the call. And I think she ended up going with like a family member or something. I don't know for uh, sure, but I think family's that fair. That's like the only excuse, right? A family. Like, that's what you would think, but you always end up getting like not the best representation when you end up yeah. going with family. Kyle's You'd sitting be there surprised, smiling. Derek. I don't No, no, I, I, don't I just like meant like that's the family. only <laughs> that's the only reason that's that we would answer, allow her. Yeah. That's the only answer David will accept for not using his team. Okay, if it's family, we'll let you oh, yeah, yeah, you can yeah. friend you can friend zone <laughs> me for that reason, but that's the only reason. That's right. That's exactly right. That's the only reason. <laughs> I remember hearing you say that once. <laughs> that's my big pet peeve that I don't ever talk about on the podcast. But like when someone messaged me on Instagram with this long question, like, help me figure out this deal. And they didn't use the agents that are on my team and they didn't use us for the thing. I'm like, then why are you coming to me to ask the question? That's like when the girl's like, yeah, I'm going with that guy, not you. And then she calls you for relationship advice. Like, what do I do to get the guy to like me? Uh, You're like, you shouldn't have picked that guy. So that's the worst, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Use a different broker and a different uh, agent and then come to you to solve all their problems. They, yeah, they weren't that good. What would you do? That's exactly oh, Tell me what you do. What do you say? Are you just like, uh, no. <laughs> well, I used to, and now I'm kind of like, uh, you made your bed. You need to go lie in it. Tell me when you want our team to represent you, and I'll be happy to help you, but I can't help other people's clients. That's a tricky thing. Now, I think we still gave her some really good advice. She's Everybody listening, if you're listening to this anytime recently from when it aired, if this is four years later, this advice might not be applicable, but you don't have to put up with stuff like you used to in most markets. Now, some you're trying to buy in Beverly Hills, 90210, you probably can't be picky. Okay. Those markets don't get hammered, but the majority of markets out there, you can be very picky about what you're going to buy right now. Sellers mm -hmm. want you more than you need them. You can write aggressive offers. When you're in contract, you can ask for aggressive concessions. The fact you're a pre-approved buyer willing to buy puts you in a very unique position where they need you. So this isn't a time to chase anything. This is a time where sellers need to be chasing buyers. Mm. Awesome. Hey, if there's something I can add that I, a question I've been getting a lot lately, um, that if I can have a couple minutes to mention it, it's, uh, how do I get a contractor to help me convert or build an ADU? And it just is kind of top of mind because we have what looked to be, I mean, one of them is in the medical field. Uh, Jesse was in scrubs. I'm assuming she's in the medical field. I'm, I'm assume, assuming she's probably not a builder, but how do I find a builder that I can develop a relationship with and eventually know, like, and trust and use and repeat business with? And um, what I've, what I do personally in, in markets outside of my own in what I, recommend people do is call your local lumber yard and ask them who's been shopping there, who's been paying their bill there for 20 years and who do they know that has integrity. And I like to tell people to call three contractors, interview all three, ask for references about recent projects with a contact number. And if you get a builder recommendation from a lumber yard and you call three of their past clients and they all tell you that they love 
you know, Jill, she did an amazing job. She built a great house. It took a little longer and cost a little more, but she had clear communication and we would totally hire her again. And you, you see that pattern, you know, that's somebody that you're going to want to hire. Um, so that's, that's just a question I get probably once a day from all over the country. So if there are people that have, that have hung in on the live or that are listening to this later, cause it's got some cool, catchy ADU title. Um, and they're wondering about how do I find a contractor? That's, uh, that's what I do. It's really good. Derek, I think we need to get Are you on any? the David Green team. You're too good to not be on the David Green team. We need to make <laughs> you, we need to figure out some way to do this. Yeah, I'm always looking to collaborate. Um, you know, I'm not really employee material, but if that's you what you needed, say, <laughs> well, this is you, more of a business partnership. Yeah, not an I'm always. I'm always looking to do equity partnerships or do something fun. I would love to look at your portfolio, David, and do a feasibility study and be like, hey, all these. I mean, I I have a mind full of useless information. I have a really good memory. So I, I know every house you've ever talked about. And I know a lot of them or all of them have value add, uh -huh. additional square footage, casitas, if it's in. Um, here, if it's in the Smokies, it's got a big garage with a bonus room above it. Like we do the same stuff. So I, I know I could add tremendous value to your team, but I like to run and ski and it would have to be, um, pretty juicy to like, make me feel like I'm, I'm going to like go do real work. I wouldn't be giving you a job. Free spirit, I wouldn't, don't worry man. about that. Yeah. We would figure it out in a way that works around the stuff that you like to do. You just have to. Yeah. Oh, I'm always game. Money. There's, there's very few teams I'd be as excited to join. We'll just put it that way. All right, Kyle, anything else you think before we get out of here? No, man, I think this is a, a great hang. Uh, yeah, one one last thing. If if you're watching this video today or you're watching it uh, in the future, do us a favor and hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Um, that does a ton for us. This is something that we want to do on a regular basis. But uh, at, at the same time, if only you know, 70, 80 people are, are showing up on a consistent basis, I don't think David's going to do it forever. So um if you are getting value out of this you're getting value out of what derek had to say tonight david and myself we would absolutely love for you guys to make sure you hit that like button and make sure you subscribe and come back for more because uh, we get a lot of value out of this i enjoy it um and i know a lot of people here do. they are appreciate that man absolutely yeah derek thank you for being here guys please do subscribe and like it and share it with other people we'd like to grow this group to be even bigger um I guess that's all I have. Derek, did you have any last words? We want to thank you for being here, man. Anything you want to leave everybody with? No, no. I just would tell you if you're interested in the ADU strategy to become a expert in your local zoning code, build relationships with the decision makers in your area, find a mentor, find a partner in your town that's built an ADU and go ask them how they did it. I'm sure they would love to share. And the only way you're going to fail at real estate is if you give up or die. That's it. Love it, man. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We'll see you on the next one. Kyle, get us out of here. See y'all. Thanks. Thanks.